Alles wat je wilde weten en nog niet wist dat je wilde weten. Een dikke shout-out naar de wetenschap. Dit is makkelijk praten. If I cover a plant in sunscreen, uh, will that affect its photosynthesis? And a lot of people believe that improving photosynthesis is going to be the way that we um, increase crop yields. Yeah, that wouldn't work if you do it with a sequoia tree. Rechtstreeks vanuit de Universiteit van Wageningen. Dit zijn Sander, Adriaan en... En wie eigenlijk? Ja, met uh, Jeremy Harbinson, onderzoeker aan de Wageningen uh, University en Research... naar de genetische variaties voor fotosynthese in planten. But I should say uh, with Jeremy Harbinson, researcher at uh, Wageningen University and Research... focusing on photosynthesis and genetic variations of photosynthetic traits... Uh, that's right. Yep, um, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> we have a first. The podcast is going to be in English today. And that's because uh, Jeremy, well, is uh, uh, Irish. Uh, right? From Northern Ireland. Of yes, Northern I Ireland. was I'd born in Belfast. So, yep. Um, th- th- as one of my um, Irish PhD students once said, I'm from the deep north. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. So we're going to do this. Uh, you do, do speak a bit of Dutch. Oh, yes. My wife's Dutch. Ah, okay. So, you know... Uh, you can say gezellig. Indeed, so gezellig and um, yeah, mag ik een beer. <laughs> Those really important words. Yeah, yeah. That's the only uh, words basically we hate. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, uh, this is where I, my Irish ancestry si- shines through, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and um, uh, yeah, yeah but, but also because um, this episode is a special episode dedicated to the 102nd birthday uh, or Dies Natalis of Wageningen University and Research, uh, which is actually the 9th of March. So that's in uh, a couple of a couple of days. Um, and because of that, the were asked us to produce an episode in English um, so that all students and researchers could enjoy our show. And we said yes. So I guess fingers crossed and forgive us our English or uh, stained coal English? Oh, uh, yes. Oh, Stone coal yeah. English. <laughs> Stone coal yeah. English. What yeah. is it? Uh, th- th- that, that's the worst part, though, because we have to listen to this when we're editing. Because normally I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm used to my own voice now because I do a lot of editing. But now it's going to be in English and it's going to be annoyed by my own English because it's always, you always have like this very Dutchy accent, accent, which always annoys me when I hear it in others. And now I'm going to hear it in myself. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be a bitch. But I think <laughs> I, th- I think we're going to get away with it because we we emphasized clearly that that yeah. it's ju- that it's going to be total shit. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so I'm sure you'll do fine. This is yeah. just a disclaimer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and now we're going to now it's going to be proper English <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, entire yeah. way. Um, yeah. So no, the the the, the Wageningen Dies title of this year is actually illuminating science for transition, uh, which uh, I think is kind of a broad theme. But what we gathered, it's all about that if we want to get to science. Uh, that works for addressing the major challenges we have in energy, food, mobility, etc. The challenges of this time, the major challenges um, that can only be done if there's space for fundamental research as well. In other words, with uh, people like you, Jeremy, um, basically what uh, people like you, Jeremy, um, researching photosynthesis um, and doing it just for fun or out of curiosity because you just want to understand how things work, basically. Um, that's a lot of introductional words. Um but to take it away, um, in uh, in layman's terms, uh, in simple words, what's that all about, your research? Well, I try and understand how photosynthesis works in leaves. Um, photosynthesis is a physiological, a plant physiological process. It's something we do associate typically with um, um, land plants, though algae, seaweeds, all photosynthesize. Um Our focus, my focus, is on plants because, well, we try and understand photosynthesis in a terrestrial environment, but also in an agricultural environment. And photosynthesis is the way that plants make more plant. Um, They're using the energy of sunlight um, to convert carbon dioxide into carbohydrates, and those carbohydrates then go on to be used to build more plant. Um, Basically, that means that every nearly every living organism on the planet, there will be a few minor exceptions, but every living organism on the planet will depend on photosynthesis. Photosynthesis really is a huge process that shapes um, the biosphere, has shaped life on Earth and is essential for life on Earth. And for us, of course, photosynthesis 
matters particularly because it's the engine of agricultural productivity. All our crops depend on photosynthesis for their growth and our farm animals depend on um, biomass, whether it's from a marine or a terrestrial environment uh, for their food. Everything we eat, therefore, is basically photosynthesis. Yeah, and more, and even on a more basic level, it creates oxygen. Indeed so. Um, practically all of the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere comes from photosynthesis. Without photosynthesis, the oxygen levels would be minute, really, really tiny. So given that oxygen is essential for, you know, the kind of um, uh, more energetic life that we uh, experience, then the life that we see on the planet really depends on the oxygen from photosynthesis as it depends on the um, organic uh, products of photosynthesis, the food that um, animals uh, and humans eat. Yes. Okay. So, and, and you're doing um, uh, fun fundamental research in, uh, in that department? Yes. On a, well, really clearly a quite fundamental uh, topic for uh, every uh, all life on Earth. Um, just before we go in depth, um, we always kickstart the episode by asking a few random questions. They yep. don't necessarily make sense. Um, they're intended to be humor humorous, uh, sure. don't always, or silly, or yeah. silly. <laughs> don't always work out that way. But we we do our best. Right um, now, I'm a bit embarrassed by these questions, but let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't know the answer, I'll do um, my best. Yeah, I'll improvise. Answer yes. answer anyway. Are you ready? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, okay. Uh, is photosynthesis available in 4K? <laughs> That's a really good question. I'm sure if I was a, 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 a better artist, I, I could find a visual metaphor that would allow photosynthesis to be beautifully shown in 4K. <laughs> okay, that's a good question. What about video synthesis? Is that a thing? Uh, yeah, I, actually, I mean, people do take pictures um, of photosynthesis. We have the technology to image it. So, yes, you can what, have what, a what video. Does, what does that look like, though? Oh, you, you would be showing um, a leaf, for example, yeah. but in a false color image with different colors representing different um, amounts of photosynthesis. So it is possible, yeah. Oh, like that. Oh, I'm actually is quite it? curious about it. Can you, can you send us one of those pictures, maybe? Uh, or, or, if or, we can find one. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't normally produce these in the course of our work um, because it's not um, so useful to us to do this. And okay. um, we, we use the technology for other things, but uh, I would have to search. Uh, oh, maybe I, we could just Google it, it because, yeah. because that will be very insightful for our listeners as well, but yeah. we can just throw that on our social but channels. It could, be, it could actually be help, helpful to let people uh, understand how it works. Or Indeed. It I mean, it, pictures are very persuasive and yeah. um, the ability to image photosynthesis has been one of the I, I think big advances in the last um, um, 25 years or so that we can now really take a picture of the process in a plant. And uh, it really lets us do lots of things that previously would have been very difficult. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Right. There you go. Um, yeah, I have a question as well. Um, how many daisies are needed for a lifetime of oxygen for one average human? <laughs> That's a really good, tough question. I would have to go away and think about that. Uh, be a quite a <laughs> you, you, could, you might make an experiment out of that, though. Just put, put a baby in a box. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just add some flowers and see how long it's going uh, uh, to I'm sure people would write, write angry letters if we were to do that. Yes. Yeah, but <laughs> they probably no. need some other things as well. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yes, it would be possible to calculate, but I, I don't have the number. Okay. But That's it, an interesting thing to calculate. I, I like the, these kind of calculations, like silly things, like what if kind yes, of scenarios yes, by yes. Randall Monroe. Yeah. I actually understand the, uh, the, 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 the purpose behind the question, and it is an interesting one. Yeah. And um, it, now that you've asked me, I think it probably motivates me to go and see if we can, um, you know, think of a way of calculating it. But I'm, I think it's possible to do so reasonably easily. Okay. Cool. Yeah. It would, it would be like in the in the in the billions, probably, uh, or, or not even. Would it? I mean, we all yeah, yeah, depends we're on life sharing spend, billions of plants. A billion right is now. a very big on, number. Yeah. You okay. Know? So, but yes. it would be also, of course, depend I on think life it would be like of a four. daisy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> more than four. Yes. Yes. Okay. So more than four. Okay. But of course, also daisies are quite small plants. So uh, yeah. 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 That's true. That's true. Okay. Um, 
speaking of uh, plants, if I cover a plant in sunscreen, uh, will that affect its photosynthesis? Sunscreen, you mean like uh, the kind of thing you put on sunblock. if you're lucky? Sunblock. Yeah. Yeah. Well, plants have their own um, sunblock. In fact, it used to be, I think, uh, one of the sunblocks that plants use um, used to be used in suntan cream, though I haven't seen it so much recently. Uh, hydroxycinamic acid. Uh, but it, yeah, plants do need to protect themselves um, from uh, ultraviolet light and um, plants growing Why? outside. Well, damages plants just as it damages us. So you could get like Sunburn. plant cancer. Well, it doesn't affect plants so much in terms of uh, cancer, but it does cause um, radiation damage. Um, so, uh, rather spectacular name for it, but it's basically what would happen to us if we were to go out into bright sunlight uh, to which we weren't. Adi uh, without adequate protection, yeah. Plants suffer the same thing. If you grow them outside, they produce these chemicals to protect themselves from UV light. But in addition, of course, uh, photosynthesis is very highly regulated to protect the plant from the damaging yeah. effects of um, some of the reactive intermediates that are formed in the process. So, 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 so a plant regulates its own photosynthesis? Oh, indeed to, so, To reduce yes. the damage, how does that work? Uh, there's a lot of uh, quite complicated mechanisms which we are still actively investigating and um, which the plants, which plants use to control the um, production of some of the reactive intermediates that are formed in the photosynthetic process. If these um, reactive intermediates were to um, form to an extent that was too great relative to the demand of the plant for these intermediates, then there's the risk of damaging side reactions, um, which um, would injure the photosynthetic machinery and have to be repaired. Okay. So a lot of understanding of photosynthesis is understanding how photosynthesis is organized and regulated to prevent the damaging side reactions from becoming too much of a problem. Oh, oh, remember, if you think, I didn't even know that. Yeah, that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, because well, you're always looking, uh, I'd probably always be looking at it from, from the angle that it's, um, that it's not, not kind of protecting itself, but more like, like the positive producing. Yeah. Well, of course, that's the, the, that's the plus side of photosynthesis, but you are dealing with um, quite reactive um, chemicals in a biological sense, and these reactive intermediates, yeah, they, they can produce negative side reactions, which will damage uh, the photosynthetic machinery and the cell more widely, uh, the cell in which photosynthesis is occurring. So there is a lot of regulation of photosynthesis to protect um, the plant um, from uh, damage. I'm actually quite, no, I'm not quite curious, but maybe for our listeners, uh, maybe we should explain briefly a, a bit more about photosynthesis, uh, what, like what happens in the leaf, because life falls on. Basically, that's like the starting point. And all I know is, well, then energy comes out and oxygen comes out. But but like, what's the dynamics in between? Well, it's, it, it is a complicated, multi-layered process. Somebody estimated that there are about a 120 uh, steps in photosynthesis. Whoa. So, yeah, and it's always go, yeah. depends on what you call a step and what kind of line you draw around photosynthesis as a process. Yeah. But, okay, what happens? Um, plants... Um, all photosynthetic organisms absorb light. They have specific pigments for doing that. In the case of plants, um, it's chlorophylls uh, A and B and some carotenoids. And that absorbed light energy is then converted into a metabolically useful form of chemical energy by a photosynthetic electron transport chain. Um, and the chemical energy that's stored yeah. via this um, uh, electron transport chain is then used to um, drive the metabolic process of carbon dioxide fixation. So carbon dioxide reacts with an organic molecule in a reaction catalyzed by an enzyme called, um, wait for it, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate <laughs> carboxylase yes. oxygenase. And someone mercifully abbreviated that to Rubisco. So okay, we call it Rubisco because uh, it's otherwise exhausting to keep pronouncing it. Yeah. But that enzyme does this first crucial CO2 trapping step, catalyzes the reaction between carbon dioxide and um, uh, sugar um, to make two, three carbon acids as a byproduct. And then those three carbon um, acids are further metabolized to form carbohydrates, which is basically the building blocks of plants. Okay. 
It's a, that's a lot, though. Yes, yeah. so it's a complicated process, and um, it, it has taken a lot of research to unravel it. Yes. And we're still trying to understand the details of its operation and regulation because, you know, the, the, the rate of photosynthesis will vary very much from one plant to another. And and because because you're, you're, you're saying, well, there's a lot of research. We still have to do a lot of research. So what are you then in, in the, the whole scope of that thing? What are you re working on right now? Well, m m over the last few years, a lot of my work's been... Um, focused on trying to understand better the genetics of photosynthetic variation. And I do that with a colleague, um, Mark Arts, um, who's a geneticist. I'm a plant physiologist. So we work together on trying to um, identify those genes which are responsible for making photosynthesis vary from um, uh, one plant, one cultivar uh, to another. Okay, so, so do I understand correctly that, that your research is about what genetics make Uh, one plant uh, differ in its differ. photosynthesis. Yeah, yeah. So yes. why one plant has a, does a lot more of, of photosynthesis than than another? Right. Basically, so. And the reason we're interested in this, apart from the fact that it's scientifically interesting, is it, in Europe, if we want to improve photosynthesis, and a lot of people believe that improving photosynthesis is going to be the way that we um, increase crop yields, at least in part. Um, We can't use GM, we can't use genetic modification or gene editing approaches, so we're going to have to improve photosynthesis using conventional plant, plant breeding. And of course, conventional plant breeding can be very sophisticated, but to do that, we do need to understand the genetic basis for photosynthetic variation. And up to now, we haven't really been able to do that, but um, various uh, technological advances in the last 20 years really make that now possible. And that's what uh, Mark and myself have spent the last, um, well, I guess 10 years um, doing, developing the techniques to do this and applying those techniques. With, um, without using GMO. So we have an option to improve photosynthesis by um, means of breeding, conventional yeah. plant breeding. How do you research something like that? Do you just look at the plants or do you put them on a microscope or how, what, what happens? For photosynthesis or? Uh, well, in general, like what, what's maybe more in general, what do you do well, to, to uh, in your research? Okay, um, I try and understand how the process of photosynthesis works in leaves and particularly in what ways it differs from one leaf to another. And that really involves, of course, we measure photosynthesis um, Using, uh, how? Oh, you, you, using um, a device called a, a machine called a gas analyzer, we measure the amount of carbon dioxide that a leaf takes up, and that's that's a, that's a direct that's indicator. a direct measurement yeah. of photosynthesis. It's the ideal measurement yeah, of photosynthesis it's, it's just, yeah, in many it's ways. Just the fuel it yeah. uses. Yeah. Um, but in, in addition, we build other machines um, that let us look into the leaf in other ways. So chlorophyll, um, one of the key pigments in photosynthesis, has um, a weak fluorescence. And we can measure that. And that gives us a lot of information about how efficiently one part of photosynthesis is using light that's yeah. absorbed by the photosynthetic pigments. I'm using that light to produce um, um, electron transport, but also the activity of some of the photoprotective processes in photosynthesis. And when a, a leaf is photosynthesizing, um, it changes color very slightly at certain wavelengths. So these are really tiny changes, about one part in a thousand. And of, we can- Of a nanometer or Well, just a, um, one part, the amount of light that's, absor um, that's absorbed by the leaf changes by about one part in a thousand. Ah, okay, yeah. Um, so 0.1% change in light absorption. Uh, we can measure this and that gives us other information about how well bits of the photosynthetic machinery are working. So what we're doing is measuring as many things as we can, looking at different parts of photosynthesis with the available technology that we have, and then um, producing an integrated picture yeah. of how that leaf is uh, functioning photosynthetically. And then we can look at how that um, operation is affected by, for example, environmental stresses like high temperature, low temperature, too much light, and um, too much, um, this kind of thing. Um, we can look at how um, 
the plant will um, the plant photosynthesis responds to fluctuations in the environment for yeah. example when the light intensity suddenly changes photosynthesis has to change in response to that so how quickly does that change occur and what are the mechanisms of that change yeah. we try to do as much of this as possible non-destructively um, so we can follow the same leaf um, for many hours or even days but in addition, we do sometimes um, sample leaves and analyze them biochemically <clears throat> and in other ways. So we can get a kind of um, a view of photosynthesis uh, w from the from in a way that require uh, we can't do non-destructively. There are still some limitations in the what we can do non-destructively. And sometimes we do have to use um, destructive methods. But yeah, so you uh, just like the, the leaf dies. Or the, the leaf has to be killed. Yes, yeah. we, the, the leaf gets sacrificed. Any protests <laughs> on that? Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be a new one. Um, well, but, wait, wait 100 yes, years. Who knows? <laughs> yes, know. uh, but save this leaf. Um, so, but it, 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 the reason for trying to do things non-destructively isn't for a sentimental or emotional reason, but just that then you, you can be following the process within the same leaf yeah. um, with time and you, you're not having to change, you know, from one leaf to another, uh, having to take into account the intrinsic variation there might be between different leaves. Yeah. Yes. So I have two questions. Uh, first of all, you just said like you're trying to paint a picture uh, by all of uh, using all these different things. How complete is that picture right now? It's getting um, more and more complete. Um, the, the technology that we have to do this, um, only a few groups in the world would have it. Um, uh, and we all of us work to try and unravel how photosynthesis is regulated. But now that we're facing the, um, a future where food security might be diminishing and we have to deal with the problems of climate change, then interest in photosynthesis as a solution to these problems is growing. So more and more people are starting to do research um, on photosynthesis, including the kinds of um, uh, research that um, I do uh, with the methods that I use. So it's speeding. So it's speeding up. Yes, more and more people working on photosynthesis. Photosynthesis now seem to be one of the possible solutions for the you know the future problems. Or some people would say there these problems are already here um, that we will face. Yeah. So at one part you, you're trying to paint this picture of photosynthesis. Yes. But then there's also the genetics part. So you're trying right. to map that against each other because what do you know about the genetics? Well, exactly. Yes. You want to, I mean, uh, genetics underpins all living organisms. I mean, we're all dependent on our, um, uh, on our genes. And if we want to understand why photosynthesis is better, let's say, um, in one plant compared to another, it will come down to genetics. Yeah. And if we want to improve photosynthesis, then it's logical, therefore, that you would try and understand the genetics of photosynthesis because it's the genes that determine photosynthesis that we want to play with whenever we want to improve photosynthesis. So that is what's motivated uh, Mark Arts and myself to spend uh, a lot of the last 10 years trying to work on this problem, how, you know, how do you um, identify the genes that are responsible for variation in photosynthesis? And then um, what can we do with that information once we have it was, you know, developing a, it as a tool for improving crop yields. So if I get this straight, you would perform an experiment on a leaf and it has, say, X photosynthesis, whatever X is. Uh, and then you have another leaf and it, it, it's slightly different if you like gene wise, and then there's Y photosynthesis. And then you know that difference could be because of its uh, genetic variations. Yes, in a way, you, you, you've you summarized it quite well. Um, oh, well, thanks. Yes, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, you, you, you did very well there. Um, what we have is a population of plants, a collection of plants that are genetically different, and we know the ways that they are genetically different because we have summarized the genetic variation in these plants um, by, uh, by genotyping them. We then put them into a large um, robotic measurement system where we grow the plants and measure their photosynthesis. We use uh, chlorophyll fluorescence to do yeah. that because that lets us measure lots of plants um, quite quickly, m several times a day, yeah. over many days. And with that, uh, those measurements, we can summarize the 
uh, photosynthetic variation in the population. So if we then correlate the photo, the, the, yeah. the, the um, uh, genotypes with the phenotypes, in other yeah. words, we correlate the uh, genetic makeup of the individuals with their photosynthesis, we can then get an idea about um, which genes are involved in determining yeah, okay. the difference yeah. that we measure. Okay, and that's not conclusive, but that, that's, that's a statistical it's, way to it, do that. It, it, it's basically a gigantic correlation exercise. Yeah, okay. And then, of course, we, we, once we have uh, an idea of which genes are responsible, yeah. the, the, the next step is to prove um, beyond reasonable doubt that, in fact, it, it is those genes doing so what we think they're doing. So then you read and prove. Yes. Okay. So where that would be the, um, the, I mean, we're doing this at this day, at the moment on um, model plant species yeah. like uh, Arabidopsis, um, mainly because these are small plants that we can grow quickly and easily. Yeah, um, because okay. I'm very yeah. interested. So where do you, where do you start? How do you, well, wh wh how do you know what plants do, do you, do you look at, well, this is, uh, this is, this is a very, well, maybe like a kind of basic plant from which uh, most, which, which is are very similar to the most crops we use or what, what how do you choose which plant you're going to use as a starting point? Well, you, you do the smart thing and the smart thing is usually do the easiest things first. Yeah. Um, and in the case of uh, this research, we decided to do it on a plant called Arabidopsis, which is a very small plant. It's really a weed. You'll find it in most gardens and things like this. Um, you know, it's pretty abundant. Um, but uh, Arabidopsis has been adopted as the genetic model for plant sciences. So we've got very good genetic resources. It's a small plant, which is convenient if you have to grow a large number, and it grows quickly, which is convenient if you don't want to spend too, too much time doing the yeah. experiment. You know, we can m do multiple um, experiments per year using Arabidopsis. So yeah, that wouldn't work if you do it with a sequoia tree. Exactly, you got it. Um, so we've started out doing this on Arabidopsis as a proof of principle. And um, with given that Arabidopsis is so small, grows so quickly, we can um, grow the very large numbers of plants that we need, and we can do multiple experiments per year um, with this plant. And that's basically been our main research tool um, over the last 10 years. We have looked at um, some um, crop plants, and we, we can kind of do the same thing with crop plants, but the um, genetic resources um, for the crop plants aren't quite as um, well developed yet as they are for Arabidopsis. So we can make um, progress further and faster with Arabidopsis at the moment, but it will be really important that we transition in the uh, coming years to do more work with crop plants because we need to show that we can do with crop plants what we're now currently able to do with Arabidopsis. But, it, you know, the proof of principle is basically being shown with uh, Arabidopsis because that is um, an easy plant for us to work with. Uh, it simplifies um, a, a lot of what we have to do. Yeah. So I guess that that maybe brings us a bit to the why, or do you have some more questions? Huh? No? Okay. So I guess that brings us to the to the why, because you're you, we were talking when we started about why this is so important for well the the challenges we have in in our in in food and and with the environment in the the coming coming decades. Yes. Um. Uh, so you need to make that transition. Mm -hmm. Sure. No. Okay. If you need to flow, then we'll we'll cut it out. <laughs> Okay, I'm back. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, I'll just start up. So, so that's um, uh, you're talking about that. That at one point you're you're gonna want to or need to transition that to crops, and that yeah. of course has everything to do with the challenges that we're facing around. Um, well, the environment, how everything's changing, our our challenges in 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 the in the food that we uh, that we're facing. Um, so, so that gets us, I think, to the why. So what, why is this, this, this important? What, what, what are we going to get out of this? Okay. Um, the global population of humans is increasing, probably be close to 10 billion by, by 2050. Those people are 
not only increasing in number, but they're getting richer. So it's expected that food demand is going to substantially increase in the coming decades, maybe increasing by about 100% relative to uh, a 2010 baseline. That's when some of the cal- uh, baseline against which some of the calculations on this were made. Now, if we're going to feed those people and we're going to feed them without um, destroying what's left of our um, uh, natural world, then we're going to have to increase the productivity of our current agricultural land. Um, How would we do that? Um, It's a big challenge, but... If you look at the factors that limit crop productivity, the one major yield trait which hasn't been um, systematically improved um, during the last 50 years or so, the last green revolution, has been photosynthesis. It's really an underachiever compared to some of the other um, uh, crop yield traits, which have now been more or less pushed to their limit. Um, so, How come? Well, um, photosynthesis is a very complicated process. It's, um, you know, whenever people were pioneering the first green revolution, photosynthesis was barely understood. Um, There were some attempts to improve photosynthesis back in the 60s and 70s, but they really didn't succeed. Um, Other yield traits um, were easier to improve. They were the low hanging fruit and they were targeted first. So we've done a lot with, the other yield-related traits like um, the um, harvest index and radiation interception by crop canopies. The the trait that's really not been improved systematically in crop plants has been uh, photosynthesis. So now a lot of focus on photosynthesis to try and use it, uh, better photosynthesis, as a way of improving crop yield. And because what what does it in the end then then do? Does it is it does it make more nutritious crops or does it make can, can we what can we more crops? Yeah, it, it produces more, more crops. Crop, uh, and in fact, you do raise an important point when you mention nutrition. Um, improved photosynthesis will will make more plant. Um, that's been shown by some pioneering work done by colleagues in the United States. If you improve photosynthesis, you do get bigger crop yields, um, but. Um, there's much more to um, uh, food than simply quantity. It's also quality. And w- one of the things that a lot of people are concerned about is that when we improve crop yields, we do so in a way which um, produces not only enough food, but that food should also be nutritious. Um And of course, it's not only nutritious for people, but also nutritious for animals, because a lot of our um, agricultural production, um, crop plant agricultural production, does um, is used to feed animals. Um, Some people think we ought to eat less meat, and that's maybe um, a a reasonable opinion. But at least as things stand, we do feed a lot of our agricultural production to animals. So it's not only being nutritious for people, but being nutritious for animals as well. We have to think about um, the reality of modern agriculture. And it's not only, like I said, it's not only going to be the amount, but also the nutritional value of what, what's uh, produced. Also, maybe how taxing it is to the environment itself? Yes, we have to figure we, these improvements in crop yield really do have to be made in a sustainable way and that is going to be a big challenge but um i i can be i think we can all be pretty certain that in the end food security will trump um sustainability and okay. you know but it, it's basically up to all of us working in plant science research in agricultural research to develop ways of producing more food Make sure that food is healthy and nutritious and that it can be produced sustainably. So it's does, going to be a big, big challenge. So how, how much of an impact does do you think your research, is, of not your research, but like photosynthesis in general is, could have? Like 5%, 10% or is, oh, is, is a percentage not uh, a thing at all? Well, I mean, some of the... Um, work that's been done by our colleagues in the US, they've shown with the even relatively modest improvements in photosynthesis, um, let's say in the order of um, 10%, you can get um, 
increases in crop yield of 20% or so. And that's really just because of the way the plants grow. Um, some work done by colleagues in the yeah. UK have shown even bigger but increases. That's huge, though. Um, yes, indeed. Um, really impressive okay. um, yield increases with relatively modest increases in photosynthesis. And it's really because for part of their life, um, plants grow exponentially. Uh, so even a small increase in photosynthesis can be, because of the exponential growth, result in a big improvement in, in, okay. in yield. So does it, does it then, because I was thinking about, about like three, um, uh, th three points you can think about. You were talking about it gets you, it gets you more plant. Yeah. Um, you were talking about it gets you uh, more, maybe a more nutritious Well, we have plant. to ensure that um, the plants, you know, retain their nutritional yeah. value. Um, as, as we grow, increase as okay. um, their um, uh, biomass, uh, does it also maybe speed up the process? So I'm just—it's just just a thought I'm having that you could maybe now you can grow it once a year, but because of if it speeds up, you can do that twice a year. So, so can that, you use the same plot for that would be an double option. yield? Exactly, that would be an option. You could ha um, have maybe two harvests per year, or. Um, just have a bigger plant and harvest it once a year. Yeah. I mean, um, how, how this would actually be implemented, how these new super crops will um, work in practice um, kind of goes uh, slightly outside my area of expertise, okay. um, but it's the kind of things you would think about more than one harvest per year, yes. Yeah. So the um, uh, the research that, that you're doing Uh, to achieve this, it's it's focusing on the uh, the more the, the traditional uh, growing of uh, of plants, um, not the not the genetic modification. Because you are you are doing research into the genetics, but it, you're it's you're not uh, putting it to use to well do CRISPR or wh whatever. Yeah. Um. So is the um because I can imagine that what you're discovering could have great benefit for that approach. Of course, it's regulated by law, but um, why, why are you uh, uh, focusing on the, uh, the, the traditional approach and not the... Well, it's, it's really because of the regulations um, within the uh, EU that um, make it rather difficult to um, use genetically modified crops in agriculture. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. Um, difficult to the point that m most people think that it is um, impractical. Um, if we can't use GM um, or gene editing approaches, then we have to use conventional breeding approaches. And that's one of the motivations behind um, Mark Arts and myself doing our research in identifying the genes underlying photosynthetic variation. If we understand those If we know what those genes are, then we can breed plants with better photosynthesis using conventional um, breeding approaches. And of course, remember, our conventional breeding approaches these days are very sophisticated. When I talk about conventional breeding, it's e easy to have an idea of a very antique world with, um, you know, people out there with uh, hand lenses doing things in the field. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very high tech process these days. Um, but it still relies on... Um, crossing of plants, producing um, offspring, and then trying to identify the best offspring. And, and how, because when you're, when you're speaking about that, I'm just wondering, does it then in the end really make a difference? Is it like just, you can either do it like the, 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 the one way around doing yes. the gene editing approach, or you do the other way around doing the, the well, breeding the moment, approach. And does the, the, is the end point kind of the same because you're so advanced? Well. Um, in, in principle, that could be the case. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the two technologies are quite distinct um, in law. So sure. uh, it, it is not possible to sort of mix yeah. and match them, at least not in, in, um, in the EU. In other jurisdictions, you could have a more um, um, complex approach where you would have um, a, a mix of genetic modification and per perhaps then um, further um, breeding by conventional means. Um, that's a little bit outside my area of expertise, but certainly within Europe, we just do not think that you can mix and match these technologies um, to suit particular challenges. We will, for the foreseeable future, have to improve crops in Europe using conventional breeding. And that means we have to um, develop a, 
an understanding of the genetics of complex physiological processes mm -hmm. like photosynthesis um, if we are to improve these processes in our future crop plants. Um, and that's a challenge for us. Um, what we discover um, en route to doing this, one, you know, the, the genes that we discover, of course, could be in, for example, the United States, um, be a target for genetic modification. So mm. it's not like our discoveries won't be useful in a world of GM. They will be, but um, the approaches used by um, those people who've done the pioneering work showing improvements in crop yield um, as a result of improving photosynthesis have depended on GM approaches. Yeah. So those improved crops um, or crop models, um, you know, will not be, um, it won't be possible to grow them in Europe. So if yeah. we want those um, improved crops, we will have to achieve, uh, you know, we'll have to reach that goal by another means. Yeah. And that other means is going to be at this stage, at least conventional yeah. breeding. Okay. So it's, it's a matter of, um, a uh, matter of regulation. It's or, a matter of regulation. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. it's starting to do um, with the sensitivity um, surrounding sure. GM that there is amongst European consumers. Um, if they don't want it, they shouldn't have to eat it. So that's, that's the world we, 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 we have. And we, we work within that. I'm just curious as to what a regular day for you looks like. Do you do you spend a lot of time in a lab or uh, what, what, yes. what is it? Because you get you up, do, you get a cup of coffee. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, I mean, uh, th th these days I spend very little time in the lab. Um, I, I kind of miss that. I'm, I mean, I, I, people start working in science because they like doing experiments. They like doing science. And that does mean for many people um, working in labs, building equipment, using equipment, doing experiments. I mean, uh, um, it's a lot of fun to do that kind yeah. of science. Um, as you get older, you spend more and more of your time um, stuck behind a computer doing things that would be considered by other people to be more um, administrative in nature. But in fact, it, it's a different kind of science. Um, you spend a lot more of your time writing things, um, reading things that other people have written, um, correcting those, um, yeah. improving them, um, you know, discussing with people what work they're doing. Um, um, PhD students, for example, um, to make sure that what they're doing is um, as good as it can be. Um, so much more time in meetings, much more time like um, sending it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a good word. Yes, manager. <laughs> I've become a manager. Um, How does that feel? <laughs> terrifying, actually, because um, as my, my wife would describe me as a rather chaotic person. So, uh, <laughs> and she's very patient. Um, but yes, I'm not a very... Um, uh, I suppose I'm not a very organized person and that's, uh, yeah, some, something which I'll have to work on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why? Yes, exactly. <laughs> but of course, skills sometimes from, it's from that disorder from, um, not being a very organized yeah. thinker that you get good ideas. Um, that's what know, I believe. Yeah. And that's what I tell myself. So, you know, part of my creativity comes from being a rather chaotic thinker. I, I tend to jump around from one thing to another. And I like doing that. It, it's interesting. Um, you land in different places and you think different th different ideas about those places. You know, you have, um, it's a very interesting way to, to do science, I believe. Um, but it doesn't necessarily set you up to be the world's um, um, best manager. Best, indeed. <laughs> best, best science manager. No. Yes, yes. Uh, so, but yeah. you, you don't perform any experiments? Uh, well, anymore. very little these days. But you um, oversee them though, I right? oversee yeah. them, yes. So other people perform them for me in a way. Um, but yeah, I, d I do miss the um, early days in my uh, career when I was doing the experiments. I was building the equipment. I was always good at developing new machines for doing measurements. That was one of my strengths, I believe. And I, I miss... Uh, that time, it, it was great fun building um, new machines to measure new things to make new discoveries. And it was very exciting. And it's um, very, very satisfying. You look back at the things that you did and um, think, well, you know, all the things that you created and the the good use that was made yeah. um, <laughs> of those technologies in pursuit of increasing 
how we understand the natural world that we'll find ourselves in. Um, science is, I believe, a deeply creative process, and we shouldn't underestimate just how much imagination and creativity goes on in science. And um, it's one of the things that I think makes science very enjoyable to do is this act of creation. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I can, I can I imagine. believe that. Yeah. When did, because when did you first, when did you know that you wanted to dedicate your life to science or more particularly to this, uh, th probably this? when I was about eight or nine. Really? Yeah, no, I, it was something I, for some reason, when I was at that age, I really thought this is what I want to do. I, I, for, I, I could see a future for myself doing science. But and was it plants already then? Um, oh no, no, I, I, to begin with, it was chemistry. I, I loved chemistry and I still do. But when I went to university, I got exposed to, um, yeah, well, I always liked growing plants. And when I went to university, I started to, to study them and gradually moved away from chemistry um, to um, studying um, plant sciences. Yeah. But cool. yes, I, yeah, it but was a, I was originally going to be a chemist. And I often wonder <laughs> how different my life would have been. Yeah, still well, yes, is. indeed. Of course, biology is very much applied. Yeah. You can see it as applied chemistry and applied yeah. physics and photosynthesis in particular. There's a lot of chemistry and physics. And that's very, it's very helpful to have a good background in physics and chemistry if you're going to work on a, in a, in a subject like photosynthesis as a physiologist. So, so, so you were talking about that, that when, when you were younger, you actually wanted to be a chemist and gradually you went into, well, biology, plants. Yeah. And it's, um, so what, what typically, what kind of people uh, work in, uh, do, do research in uh, photosynthesis? It, it, it is very diverse. It, it's a huge um, process in terms of its complexity. Um, so I work in the biophysics group in the, uh, the University of Wageningen. Um, I'm a really a, more of a physiologist than a physicist, but it, there are lots of, there are some of my colleagues here are, are really uh, physicists. Um, others will be chemists, biochemists, physiologists, um, geneticists, phylogenomicists. So they're looking at um, the um, variation um, in photosynthesis between different group groups of plants, um, putting it rather simply, um, ecologists, ecophysiologists, bioinformaticians, crop physiologists. Um, there's a whole range of uh, scientific specializations who work on photosynthesis in one way or another. And one of the really good things about doing photosynthesis in Wageningen is a lot of these people are here. Um, you know, in most other universities, you don't have that breadth of expertise that we have in Wageningen when it comes to plant, scientists, uh, plant sciences. So um, it's a great place to, to actually work on photosynthesis because we have so much expertise across a wide range of fields, all of whom can um, make their own contribution to understanding yeah. uh, photosynthesis and possibly improving it or possibly just trying to make sense of what photosynthesis means for plants, for the biosphere, um, people who are interested in um, the, the subject because of the scientific challenge that it represents. There's a lot of different motivations when it comes to working on photosynthesis. So on your, when we take it to your research, your project now, so how many, from, uh, how many different fields would, would, are people working on that then? To just, just to put on a number, have to, to have a big a bit of an idea how fast that is. Well, I mean, um, in our own research, in the research we yeah. do here, oh, well, um, we have at the moment um, a very multidisciplinary process, which involves, I think, about five or six different um, distinct fields. Yeah. Yes. And say that's one of the good things about working here. We can put together these complex pro programs and do them within um, uh, Wageningen because we have the expertise here. Thanks, wetenschap. Yeah, because what we uh, also tend to end with is um, uh, we asked you to think about something yes. that makes you grateful for science in general, something that makes you say, yeah, thanks, science. What is that? Enlighten us. Yeah, I, I thought about this. I thought it was a really interesting question. And 
of course, you start thinking about those more headline modern results of scientific progress, like semiconductors and all of the things we can now <laughs> yeah. do. The fact that we're here doing yeah. this is yeah. uh, dependent it's on everything. Is semicon um, exactly. But I suppose uh, thinking around it, if you th imagine having things taken away from you, uh, what would be that's, the one thing that good, you wouldn't want to lose? And I guess it comes down to either anesthesia or antibiotics. Because yeah. um, I was thinking, well, imagine what it would have been that like. Would suck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It would be worse than that, really, wouldn't it? <laughs> imagine what it would be like having an operation without anesthesia. Yeah. Imagine having to take your um, someone you love to a hospital where they were going to be operated on without pain relief and you would be, yeah. ooh, no, I wouldn't really want right. that. So, uh, and antibiotics of it's likewise. Worse, like, yeah. That's like, imagine having to bury something because they cut their finger. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, that's why I, I, I would be choosing either between uh, anesthesia yeah. or antibiotics and possibly anesthesia. I, I guess that's been, for many people, um, it's, it's very unrealizing. Yeah, yeah. So you, you don't just take it for yeah. granted. You don't, but you don't think about yes. it because it's such a, it's a routine thing. Yeah. Yes, but if you go to hospital, you have an operation, you fall asleep before it, and you wake up after it, and basically you remember nothing. And it didn't used to be like that. So I, I would go for anesthesia. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it really it's interesting. I, I never looked at it that way, but yeah. it's really it's, it's kind really of a true. very obvious answer. But nobody uh, gave that answer yet, did they? Yeah. So uh, good, good answer. Thank actually. you. Now, yes. I'm, now I'm very grateful for it as well. So yeah. that means it's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. yeah, I think that marks the end of this uh, this episode of uh, Makkelijk Praten. Um, okay. Jeremy, thanks for joining us. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about uh, my work. Yeah. Um, as Very all welcome. our guests, we're going to reward you with uh, the one and only Makkelijk Praten mug. Um, oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> so that, that you can have that on your desk while, yes. you're, uh, while you're managing. Uh, <laughs> it's a really managerial mug. You can mm. really, no. But so, um, uh, uh, so you'll be getting one. Um, we'll be back in uh, two weeks with a new uh, Makkelijk Praten podcast. Uh, a regular Dutch uh, episode uh, yeah. in two weeks. Meanwhile, you can follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and all other podcast apps, and of course, our social media channels. Subscribe. Subscribe. Yeah. Please like, rate, everything. Um, no less than five stars, please. <laughs> um, everyone at Wageningen University in Research, happy birthday, of course. Thank um, you. Oh, yeah. And uh, have a great day, the 9th of March, and a yep. lot of fun uh, with talking about the uh, illuminating science for transitions topic. Uh, and I hope you have a great party as well. There's going to be a party, right? Oh, it's a very sober party. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Uh, <laughs> yes, I uh, know. It's parties aren't what they used to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's anyway, too bad. <laughs> uh, it's, nevertheless, a lot of fun at the yes. sober party. Yeah. Um, and as always, uh, thanks to our uh, our partners, starting, of course, with uh, Wageningen University and Research, but also Utrecht University, um, the University of Amsterdam, um, and uh, NICAF. Um, and we'll see you in two weeks. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Tot de volgende.